Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We're waiting for everybody to get into the Zoom room, so give it just a second. Good morning and welcome to the Leadership Asheville Summer Buzz Series. My name is Ed Manning. I'm the Executive Director for Leadership Asheville. Really want to thank you all for joining us this morning. I know there's a few more people. I see the number still going up. We had about um, close to 300 folks register and we're hitting about 200 right now. So it might be just a second longer before we get everybody on. As we go forward, I first want to thank our sustaining or uh, co-presenting sponsors this morning. Dixon Hughes Goodman and the Van Winkle Law Firm really appreciate their help and support with Leadership Asheville. And it's my pleasure to introduce Amy Bibby, who is the office managing partner at Dixon Hughes Goodman's Asheville office. Amy, you want to say a few words of welcome? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Ed. And, and thanks, everyone, for being here this morning. Um, you know, this is, I'm, I'm seeing the attendee number rise, and that's really exciting, uh, scanning the, the list here, so, and so great to see so many familiar names. Um, and, you know, I know we're all learning so much in this new environment, so thanks, everyone, for um, transitioning so easily over to a virtual meeting this morning. Um, I have the pleasure of just saying good morning. And um, again, I'm a, a partner with Dixon Hughes Goodman. If you're not familiar with DHG, we're um, a tax audit and consulting firm. And we are so proud to have our roots here in Western North Carolina in the Asheville area. And um, just wanna, again, extend a warm welcome to everyone wherever you are. Um, whether that's in your home office, um, sitting on your couch, the guest bedrooms, et cetera. Um, it's just so good to have everyone here. And I'd like to just extend a thank you to UNCA and to our speakers this morning. Um, it's going to be an exciting program. So uh, with that, uh, I will turn things back over to Ed. Thank you, Amy. I really appreciate it. And thanks again to Dixon Hughes Goodman and uh, the Van Winkle Law Firm, who are uh, both co-sponsors for the Summer Buzz Breakfast. It's really appreciate you guys and the support you give us. I also want to thank our sustaining sponsors, um, TD Bank, Waste Pro, and the Van Winkle Law Firm uh, for their continued support of Leadership Bashville and the programs that we run. As well, I'd like to thank our community partners, uh, Blue Ridge Public Radio, the Crown Plaza Resort. I'm sorry we couldn't be there and meet in person, but we'll hopefully do that soon. Uh, 103.3 Asheville FM Radio, Gray Line Trolley Tours, and the YMCA Blue Ridge Assembly all do in-kind donations and are really supportive of our work, and I really appreciate it. I want to thank our buzz planning team. The summer team was Jesse Fry, Michelle Keenan, uh, Lise Lewis and Austin Pullison, all Leadership Asheville 37 graduates. And again, they've done a great job twisting and turning and adapting as we went through changes from what we thought we were doing four months ago to what we're now doing today. And they've done a fabulous job with that. So thank you. And of course, thanks to Jan Lowe, who's in the background here, helping with keeping things running at Leadership Asheville. So really pleased to introduce and very excited about today's program. We have a, a very distinguished panel with us this morning. The team looked at um, how Asheville rises. Obviously, we're facing some pretty tough challenges, and we have faced those in the past. So it's uh, my pleasure to sort of welcome today's panelists, uh, starting with Dr. Kevin Frazier. He's the executive director at Western Carolina University uh, for their Asheville programs. Um, he also is a native of Asheville, founder of Asheville by Foot Walking Tours, one of the co-owners of Well Played Board Game Cafe. Um, so very involved with um, Asheville and its history, a former history professor himself. Um, 
He's, uh, as you can see, done lots of talks and has written a book um, around the um, legends of local Asheville. And he's a graduate of Leadership Asheville Class 34. I'm really excited to have Kevin give you some of the history for those of you who haven't been here more than 20 years. I'd like to also welcome Mr. Pat Whalen. He's attorney and businessman, been active in downtown revitalization and historic reno renovations for decades. Um, he's the president of Public Interest Projects. It's a for-profit downtown investment development firm that was funded and inspired by the late Julian Price. Um, he has invested lots of money in our downtown and really, uh, for those of you who are new to Asheville and don't know the history, um, it, Asheville was boarded up, and Kevin will tell you about this, um, most of Asheville is boarded up in downtown, and, and um, Pat has done a fabulous job in really revitalizing and, and um, creating the downtown vibe, including the Orange Peel, which is one of his. Um, it's been nationally recognized, um, as you well know. They're also looking at a new venture with um, Asheville Pizza and Brew for another live event um, in down, downtown. We're looking forward to that. And then it's also uh, joining us today, uh, Mr. Jack Cecil. He serves as president and CEO of Biltmore Farms. Um, Mr. Cecil has been doing so much work in this area and his family has been doing so much work in Western North Carolina. It's hard to get all of his bio on the screen. Um, but there's a few things here. Um, Biltmore Town Park, as you well know, um, he has done, he's a steward of economic development across the state and certainly in Western North Carolina. He serves as chair and member of the National Advisory Board of the Institute for Emerging Issues, a governor for the Urban Land Institute Foundation, is on the board of directors for the Research Triangle Foundation of North Carolina. He holds the position of chair for the Western North Carolina Regional Advisory Board of Wells Fargo, trustee of the Duke Endowment, vice chairman of the Dogwood Health Trust, and director of Barron Collier Management. He's also a graduate of Leadership Asheville Class 34. So we are thrilled to have all of you with us today um, and really looking forward to our conversation. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin Frazier, who is going to take us through most of the program, and thank you to our panelists for taking time out of your schedules to join us this morning. Kevin? Good morning, neighbors. It's good to be with everybody this morning, even if virtually. Let me get pulled up some uh, photographs for us to share during the talk. And Ed, I'll just confirm from you that that seems to be showing. It's showing. Great. These are our mountains. These beautiful mountains. Do you have those mornings that you realize, oh, I really live here? You know, that's what drew the Cherokee in their early settlement. It's what drew the settlers from the early Republic. These were folks who came with a strong sense of resiliency. Because the truth is, the mountains aren't an easy place to call home. There's much easier land to farm down in the foothills and in the flatlands. To make the choice to live in the mountains was to make the choice for a tough life for both the Cherokee and for the early Republic settlers. They brought with them a really strong sense of resiliency. And despite all of the challenges, by the late 1790s, they had planned their first town. What was originally called Morristown and then later renamed Asheville and officially chartered in 1797. Now Asheville is very much a small little hamlet deep in the Blue Ridge. It was remote, it was hard to get to. The city's principal economic driver for many years was livestock droving, thus our beloved pigs downtown, a homage to the old Buncombe Turnpike folks who were raising animals north of us, taking them to market south of us. Asheville was a stopover point along the way. Asheville is really a small hamlet, even by the middle of the 19th century, but the remoteness that kept Asheville small would prove fortuitous by the coming of the American Civil War. Sherman was never gonna march through Asheville. It wasn't strategic, it was hard to get to, and as such, Asheville is physically unharmed by the war, there is a battle fault just north of downtown where the university campus is today, but it is not a turning point by any stretch in the war. 
The greatest loss was the loss of life of women and men who had served in the war and never came home. So while Asheville was physically unharmed, it struggles. One of its first major crises, one of five we'll talk briefly about this morning. Asheville struggles like much of the rest of the Reconstruction South. Um, its agrarian economy had been turned upside down. It had many folks that never came back home and struggles. Asheville had had um, a small agrarian economy, not the big plantation economy that Eastern North Carolina did. And as such, Asheville has a much smaller slave population, which I think may actually have been part of the draw for freedmen, former slaves and their families who are looking to build new lives like Isaac Dixon. We know by name from one of our schools, he's the gentleman on the left-hand side, who were drawn to Asheville to look for a new life. And that's what we would finally begin to see by the 1880s with a notable change in the coming of the railroad. The railroad changes everything from Asheville. I love this postcard. If you look at the top, Asheville, North Carolina, where life is worthwhile. Uh, the railroad opened up Asheville in a way that it had never been before. And there were a couple of physicians, notably Carl Van Ruck and Samuel Westray Battle, who began to build Asheville as a great health resort, a place to come to for whatever ailed you. We had two groups of folks that were drawn. First were convalescents, people who were suffering from a number of ailments, particularly pulmonary ailments. The notion was, you know, fresh mountain air. We became especially popular among sufferers of tuberculosis, to the point that before the end of the century, we had the reputation as America's tuberculosis capital. Probably not what you want to put on the Chamber of Commerce brochure. The other group were tourists, folks who were drawn to Asheville because of the great climate. Now we had seen some tourists before the war, mainly out of coastal South Carolina, but as I said, Asheville's hard to get to. The railroad makes it easier to get to and we began to see a growth throughout the, cor the industrial corridor, Philadelphia, New York, Boston, folks coming to Asheville. The middle class is still pretty small, even though burgeoning. The folks who are coming to Asheville are people of means, folks who have wealth who could come for um, four week, eight week stays, folks like George Washington Vanderbilt. George fell in love with Asheville uh, so much that uh, he told his mom, well, I think I'm gonna build a little summer cottage that we can retreat to uh, from the hustle and bustle of New York and thus Biltmore is formed. By the time he marries in the late 1890s, Edith Stuyvesant Dresser, Asheville was starting to become a bit of a boom town. And much of that, frankly, driven by the new uh, resources coming in from tourism. In 1890, Asheville's population was 10,000. By 1900, 14,000. And by 1910, a little over 18,000. Picture of the square in the 19 teens. We'd see continued growth in tourism, new hotels, You'll notice I'm going to put some of the historic pictures, but I'm also going to have a few photographs of the current location. While you may be identified the Grove Park Inn, there'll be a few along the way that you probably won't recognize, such as the old Landgren Hotel, now the site of the AC Hotel. So we had both the uh, mountainside hotels and the downtown hotels, and Asheville was frankly really cooking through the 19-teens until the coming of World War I. And World War I turns everything upside down. Uh, Asheville again loses a generation of folks who go to serve in the war. And to add insult to injury in 1916, there is a massive uh, collection of hurricanes. They come up through the South and cause enormous flooding in Asheville. This is the River Arts District. And um, it's over to your right is where the French Broad River should be. This one's a little bit more dramatic. It takes a moment, but if you look just slightly to the left of the center, you'll find your landmark. That's the roof of All Souls Cathedral. The area surrounding downtown was devastated. And then to make things worse, as the, as the city starts to dry out, the Spanish flu hits Asheville very hard. By the end of 1918, nearly 7,000 folks in Asheville and Buncombe County had come, had had contracted the flu. It, we call it the Spanish flu. It, it's what you and I know as the flu. And it really uh, took the city by surprise. 
uh, to the point that there were so many folks that needed to be hospitalized, they were having to make makeshift hospitals. Unfortunately, this is, of course, in the days of segregation. There was not a ward for African Americans, and the fellows at the Masonic Temple in, uh, vacated their brand new building so it could be used as a ward for African American patients. And then I also pulled a little um, a photograph of one of the local folks wearing a mask. I don't know if you saw yesterday, there has been some concerns about folks being mocked wearing masks around town. Well, there was, in fact, I found a little article from the October of 1918 where the newspaper said, oh, it's almost like Halloween's come early, all of these folks in masks. Within four weeks, the paper says, wear your masks wear your mask. By the time the soldiers come home, um, Asheville was suffering economically, but much like the rest of the country and the world, has a sense of optimism. There was a belief that World War I would be the last war ever, literally the last war ever. And so that optimism will begin to play itself out in a sense of what I would call urban patriotism. Uh, an idea that Asheville and we would see this civic pride throughout cities and um, throughout the whole country was really going to become a major center. We'd see new hotels built, again, supporting the growth in the tourism industry, but also Asheville's economy began to more richly diversify. Significant manufacturing came to the area and significant commercial enterprises as well. By the end of the decade, Asheville was very much a boom town. In fact, it's one of the fastest growing communities in the entire country. In 1920, the population was 28,000 in a decade. It had nearly doubled to well over uh, 50,000 folks. Um, Asheville begins to show its great civic pride in its own municipal building campaign called the Program for Progress that built such great things as City Hall and the Asheville High School. Asheville is very much a city on the rise, and it is truly believed that it would become one of the major um, municipalities of the Southeast, if not the East Coast. It had the money and the people coming in to believe that would be true. But as these came, were signs of Asheville's great prowess, they came to be signs of its excess. It had funded the, night, the boom of the 1920s through an enormous amount of municipal bonds based on a stock market that was trading on margin, and by the time the stock market crashes in 1929, Asheville and Buncombe Howdy County had a combined municipal debt of $54 million. In today's money, $780 million, the largest per capita debt in the country at the time. Asheville's bank, Central Bank, collapses as well, and Asheville finds itself flat broke but makes the decision that it will repay all of its debts. It decides not to go bankruptcy, go uh, declare bankruptcy. Folks said we're good Appalachian stock, we pay our bills. Absolutely true. Also, many of the men in power own those bonds, and if they didn't get their money, maybe their grandchildren would. It, of course, is World War II that pulls the United States out of the Great Depression. And after the war, Asheville, like the rest of the South, finds itself needing to come to terms with a long legacy of segregation. And there's a group of brave students at Stevens Lee High School, then the all-black high school, that formed the Asheville Student Committee on Racial Equality, shown here 50 years later in reunion, that would stage the first sit-ins in the 1960s at our own F.W. Woolworth, inspired by the sit-ins by those four brave students at um, North Carolina A&T in Greensboro. Asheville, after the war, finds itself with a new set of tourism assets, the Blue Ridge Parkway and the Great Smoky Mountains Park, which had been developed during the Great Depression, but hadn't received much use. It's also after the war that um, the legacy of the Vanderbilt family, now the Cecil family, um, moves to the third generation, to the grandsons of George Vanderbilt. An important decision was made to separate the operations into two main companies, then what was called Biltmore Dairy Farms, headed up by the older brother, George, shown here, now run by uh, his son, uh, Jack. And then the house moved into what was called the Biltmore Company, still is, headed up by William Cecil, the younger brother, now headed up by his son, Bill Jr. Asheville would find itself in the 50s and 60s 
still a, a strong community. We're the only city in Western North Carolina and the other 17 counties like today still have a pretty significant commercial economic uh, reliance on us. Uh, but it's not on sure footing because of that enormous debt that it had. Nonetheless, Asheville's continuing its investments like the Crosstown Freeway. So it takes a moment, you can really appreciate this photograph as you see not the interstate, but the freeway, what later becomes the interstate being put in the city. And then Asheville briefly flirted with a planning movement called um, urban renewal. The idea was to bring the much sexier suburban landscapes to downtown. Uh, much of that, unfortunately, throughout the country is done on the backs of African American communities, and it was in ours as well. Uh, frankly, the land was cheaper and it was considered an easier way to redevelop. By the late 50s, Asheville's commerce begins to shift from downtown to the first suburban ring. This is uh, Westgate, uh, when it's first finished, originally for uh, Winn-Dixie and Bon Marche, and then later we know it as for Earth Fair. But significantly by 1970, the opening of the Asheville Regional Mall shifted commerce out of downtown. All the big department stores except J.C. Penney's moved out of downtown. This isn't unique to Asheville, it's going on all over the country and it proves devastating to downtowns. Um, you know, the Asheville Mall is actually not that far from downtown, is it? But it's just far enough. And within short order, 1970s Asheville, the Asheville I grew up in as a kid, is an Asheville that falls apart shockingly quickly. And a lot of that had to do with weak economic footing from that enormous debt. Some photographs of the city um, in the 1970s through the 1980s. Uh, this was our love affair with aluminum siding. I definitely had to put the building pictures so you could recognize them today. Um, our beloved square when it is boarded up. And you know, there were a few businesses surviving. You'll notice beside Finkelstein's pawn shop, G's adult shop, I remember that very clearly at about eight years old, I asked my mother why adults needed their own shop. And I really wish I remember what her answer was. And then the Fine Arts Theater, where we go see independent films today, shall we say was a much less reputable theater. You can see that the feature, this is a photograph from 1985, was Sassy Sue and Three on a Waterbed. By 1976, Asheville does repay all of its Depression era bonds. It's the only city in American history to do so and begins to ask the logical question, so what now? So a Blue Ribbon Commission reported to the city council that said the best way to save downtown is to tear it down and start over. And it proposed to the city council in 1980 to buy under eminent domain the better part of a dozen blocks centered around North Lexington Avenue to build another indoor shopping mall. Uh, this is pretty important to us, which is exactly why city council said, of course, we're going to do this because every city in the country was doing something like this. However, there were some locals, notably Wayne Caldwell, who formed the committee to save downtown, said, no, let us turn our misfortune of the Great Depression into fortune. And one of his committee members, Peggy Gardner, a local artist and a fan of the artist Cristo that does those big fabric installations around the world, had the idea to surround all dozen blocks in sheets and people as an effort to show you this was what was going to be lost if we voted for the bond referendum that would have built the downtown mall. The bond referendum fails by a two to one majority. At the same time, other folks wanted to bring people downtown and one of the ideas was to have a small celebration. They called it Bell Share and it was first held on Lexington Avenue in 1978. A couple of thousand people came. By the time of the last Bell Share in 2013, it took up the entirety of downtown and 450,000 people came. Some folks said, well, you know, why don't we get folks downtown again? We'll do a little bit of a um, discovery uh, uh, treasure hunt with art and history. And Grace Pless and others had the idea for Ashland's beloved urban trail. There had been efforts at downtown revitalization. Uh, the Northwest Bank building was built in the 60s. And then the Agzona Corporation, now owned by the Biltmore Company, in the late 70s and early 80s, efforts at bringing a greater corporate presence to Asheville. Then there's a couple of things that happened by the late 70s, which are a little mundane, but I'll tell you they're important. One of which Asheville votes for liquor by the drink. 
liquor by the drink allowed bars and restaurants with bars to open up for the first time. Um, that brought, believe it or not, for the first time, national chains. I remember when Red Lobster opened up, folks thought it was the second coming. Um, in 1983, the Buncombe County Tourism and Development Authority is created. Um, that's an important change that creates the hotel tax that has allowed Asheville to market itself for the 40 years that have followed. By the late 80s, the Asheville Downtown Association was also created as a tool to help d develop and support downtown enterprises. We also had folks who were willing to step up on their own. The retired um, editor and vice president of Southern Living Magazine, Roger McGuire, would put together some great folks like uh, Karen Tessier and others who would do projects like Buncombe Dis um, Asheville Buncombe Discovery, where you brought fifth graders downtown those are the fifth graders that come downtown as adults today. I'm doing a number of projects from housing on um, uh, at 60 Haywood Street, one of our first uh, uh, revitalized housing projects since the Great Depression. Roger would uh, be instrumental in saving the Grove Arcade, as well as the creation of the Pack Place um, uh, Arts and Science Center, what we now know as the new revised Asheville Art Museum. The city would finally focus on downtown development itself with its first downtown specialist, Leslie Anderson, and her dear friend, not sister, Becky Anderson, would be a key figure in also helping to create Pack Place, um, as well as being the founding director of Handmade in America to save and promote craft. You may ask, why is the Royal Bank of Scotland on this slide? Because at the time the city was trying to do Pack Place, no American bank would give us any money. The Bank of Scotland is who financed the project. Lou Bissett would be our first elected mayor. Um, had we not had a mayor, absolutely we had, but they were chosen by city council from within. He'd be the first one elected throughout um, by the general populace. And in the late 80s, his commission got particularly noted among controversy for building parking decks in, an, in a mostly abandoned downtown. Thank God they built the parking decks. By 1990s, Julian Price literally is passing through town, falls in love with the place, and brought with him a significant, um, a significant wealth from uh, family and family ownerships and leadership in Jefferson Pilot Insurance. He would eventually form Public Interest Project, headed by Pat Whalen and his wife Karen Ramshaw, who have continued for the years that have followed to do some of our most important downtown. Um, projects not only that have revitalized but saved some really important buildings for us. All of this is what we call the Asheville Renaissance. Let's just date that from roughly 1985 to 2015. I do think that the Renaissance closed out about 2015. At that point we had revitalized. It was about moving forward and new and new ventures. And I put this list of all of these great folks who played key roles in this uh, because it's important to note it took people to make this happen. And while that may seem just obvious, I think sometimes we can get caught up in the actions and not realize that it's really good leadership. Many of these folks, by the way, leadership Asheville graduates themselves. While we were, while we were having good times in the early 2000s, things began to, um, we began to have some struggles. One was from enormous flooding, again from hurricanes, um, that really devastated the city. Uh, do these photographs look extremely and shockingly familiar? However, by the end of that decade, Asheville was uh, still seeing investments in housing downtown. In fact, we were seeing our first new housing going in downtown. And then also suburban developments like Biltmore um, Park done by the Biltmore Farms uh, Corporation. And then, of course, the Great Recession comes. And with that, a lot of our strong footing was shaken um, under, out from under us. But Asheville, frankly, was a little slow to go into the recession and a little slow to come out, but begins to focus on some key investment areas. Three main industries in particular, healthcare, tourism, and manufacturing. Um, one of the great misconceptions in, in our community, I find, is 
an assumption that manufacturing is quite small. Actually, manufacturing is almost as large as tourism. It's a very significant part of who, of who we are today. All of that has also added to the growth in the arts, things like beverage manufacturing and beer and our great restaurant scene. Again, it's one of those mundane things. The General Assembly a few years ago approved beer brewing at the higher ABV. And while that may seem absolutely unimportant, it was crucial in the creation of the craft beer industry. That one decision by the General Assembly has frankly been worth almost a billion dollars a year to Asheville. Those kinds of key decisions can have really important effects. Even in the restaurant community, the city council decision to allow sidewalk dining, that alone is worth about $16 million a year in revenue in our community. Little decisions can have big impacts. Now, just last year, we're looking at how do we move forward as a community? Our comprehensive plan with Living Asheville, our tourism management plan through the TDA and the Asheville Greater Program through the Chamber of Commerce. We've already begun to do good work for a post-COVID life. Um, Asheville is very much a community of resilience. If there's any poster child for this in America, it's Asheville. I've supported a lot of underdogs in my life, most of whom have remained underdogs, with one big exception, and that's my hometown and my community in Asheville. This morning, I'm really glad to have with me two of the folks who have been really key architects in um, a couple of Asheville's major periods of um, revitalization, uh, Jack Cecil with Bootmore Farms and Pat Whalen with Public Interest Projects. And Jack, we'd like to turn to you first to talk a little bit about the work you and your family have been doing in the community for many, many decades now. Kevin, thank you. Uh, um, your slides are pretty telling. I think Ed introduced me as Leadership Asheville 34. Uh, technically, I think I was four, and, uh, but I'd like to be in your age group to be in uh, Leadership Asheville 34 rather than uh, one of the early ones. But uh, it's uh, delight, delighted to be here this morning. And I was hoping you were going to call on uh, Pat first, because if it wasn't for the good work that Pat did, with Julian Price and his visionary, we wouldn't have such a strong urban downtown core. And without that, you don't have a community. Without that, you don't have the regional draw and ultimately the, the, the national draw, which Asheville has had. Uh, we've been the good fortune of uh, being in the community for four generations, watching it ebb and flow, uh, the good times, the bad times. I was uh, sort of chuckling to myself, and I, I hate to say it, but the picture you had of the flood, the first one is a 1916 flood, and you could, uh, as you know, you can go down to the river, uh, and you can see the line on the side of the brick building as high as the water was. And then and for Biltmore Village, more uh, sort of specifically, when you enter the, the Biltmore House, and Biltmore Estate, you see the, the lovely um, uh, brick and stucco walls, uh, they're not there anymore because the 1916 flood took that down the river, uh, along with the nursery and many other assets in, in Biltmore Village. And then you look at the, the more recent picture you took, it's just to remind all of us that uh, uh, we have to work through and enjoy the good times, but also keep a little seed corn uh, for the bad times, because it is all cyclical, uh, and we're right in the middle of one uh, right now. So um, a little bit of, sort of from where I'm coming on, on this conversation, uh, Kevin. Um, my great-grandmother, um, well, let me back up, my great-grandfather, uh, George Vanderbilt, and his wife, Edith, um, not only did he build the house as a bachelor, but he was also very committed to the community. And, uh, and she was a great steward of um, reaching out and helping people all through the Western North Carolina. Uh, as many people are attracted to the house, there's a whole other side of his interest in coming to Asheville, and that was his civic responsibility. The All Souls Church in Biltmore Village, uh, now the Cathedral of All Souls Church, he funded it, but more importantly to me is what went with that and was part of the outreach of the church was the Clarence Barker Hospital. 
named in, in honor of one of his, his uncles. And uh, he had a couple of aunts that helped fund that initially, which eventually became Billmore Hospital, um, the, the Art Deco concrete building beside it, because the original part of the original building burnt down at one point. So the disaster there rebuilt themselves. And eventually in 1947, the uh, Biltmore Hospital and uh, Mission Hospital, the Negro Hospital, which was on uh, Biltmore Avenue, um, and the Norman Hospital all came together, which then formed uh, Memorial Mission Hospital. And so there's um, a little bit of healthcare in my background uh, for many, many uh, years. As a matter of fact, when the hospitals merged in 1947, my maternal grandmother was on the board. Um, our family attorney, Junius Adams, was on the board. And so was a gentleman by the name of uh, Edward Mitchell, who ran uh, Biltmore Dairy Farms at the time. So it was obviously very important to our combined family uh, to provide good, quality, accessible, affordable health care for the citizens of, of Western North Carolina. The other piece that uh, he strongly believed in was, was education. And you touched on Becky Anderson and uh, Handmade in America. Uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to be the founding chairman of that organization. And for 15, 20 years, we tried to rekindle and rebuild the, the craft business uh, around Western North Carolina, not just in, in downtown Asheville, but around all the, what you and I would call 16, 18 counties of Western North Carolina. But that all started also uh, with um, the founding of Biltmore Industries uh, in Biltmore Village. And the idea there was you had two spinster uh, women came out of uh, Scotland, I believe, and they wanted to create uh, jobs for the, the, at that time, the, the poor boys of, of the mountains eventually saw the wisdom and had opened it up to women as well. But that's where they started teaching craft. Uh, it was woodworking, it was metalworking, it was uh, clay, et cetera. Um, and that played off what was also going on at Penland and John C. Campbell Folk School. So there was an educational component of which he was, was intrigued with as well. And then his uh, environmental stewardship, uh, as most of you know, he founded the first forestry school in America, a built more forestry school out in the cradle forestry, which is now Pisgah National Forest. And his love was not to accumulate land for the sake of owning it, but it was really to prove to America that you could have sustainable forestry practices, improve the ecology of the, of the land, and uh, by having a better flora and fauna, and also make it sustainable, meaning you, it was profitable. So when he ended up with 125,000 acres, it wasn't a land grab, but it was a way to reestablish these forests. Uh, your opening uh, picture, I think, was over towards Mount Pisgah. And the property went from here to over Mount Pisgah and down into the, basically what's the town of Brevard uh, now. But it gave him a, a place with Dr. Carl Shank that he could prove that the modern, modern back then, late 1890s, uh, modern forestry practices of Europe would be uh, sustainable here in, in North America. And that lasted until just after his, he, he died in 1914. Uh, and then uh, about 85, 86,000 acres of that property went into what is now Pisgah National Forest. Um, and he's very much interested in, in economic development. And, and also, uh, I talked about creating the jobs with the uh, Biltmore Industries. But he also was interested in the, the African American community in town. They had done so much for him and, and the family. Uh, when he first moved to Asheville um, in the YMI downtown, uh, he funded that as a, as a cultural hub for that community where they would have uh, a drugstore and food outlets as well as theater and athletics and recreation. So I, I go through all that because when my father returned to uh, Western North Carolina, having been born here in 1925, but educated in Europe, he returned after World War II in 1947 is a young man of 25, uh, 22 years old. And one of his first interests was in the agriculture and the dairy, but also in the region. And uh, he was very much supportive and was one of the founding people of what's now known as WNC Communities, headed up by L.T. Ward. And the idea there was uh, 
these backwoods and hollers and creeks were really, really poor. This is before the days of a rural electric effect, electrification. Uh, no, no sewage, all, mostly outhouses, very few community centers, and, and the schools were basically in the quote, bigger urban centers. Um, so he with others, Lloyd Langdon, went down to uh, Tupelo Honey and interviewed the editor of the, the newspaper who was started an initiative after the people died, they left it in the foundation. They wanted to rebuild the, the community in the county around Tupelo. And my father was just telling me this story oh, within three weeks ago that they were driving down to Tupelo and it was almost as if they came to this oasis. All of a sudden the buildings were painted, the driveways were cleaned up. There were post office boxes. You could see schools, you saw community centers and eventually they hired a guy uh, and they brought him back to Asheville and founded WNC Communities. I go through all of that because that's the, the legacy. You, you can't choose who your parents are, you can choose who you're married to. Uh, and I have that, that bit of legacy in me that my father and, and others have instilled in me that one needs to look at the community holistically and sustainably. And to me, that means you need to pay attention to healthcare, to education, to economic development, to the arts and culture, and also be a good steward of, of the environment. So throughout my 36 years of, of proudly working with my father, everything that we have done and all the investments we have made has been tied to trying to improve the economy of Western North Carolina. And our asset is, is land. And how do we put it to productive use in order to improve the incomes of the citizens of Western North Carolina. And you will see in most of my um, business career or throughout my entire business career, I have spent my time uh, either in the, the company or in civic responsibilities or through the philanthropy of, uh, of the family and, and Sarah and myself has all been directed to healthcare, education, economic development, arts and craft and culture or the environment because we feel that's the founding, the, the, the building blocks, if you will, of an economy that can be resilient in your words, but also can manage the ebbs and flows of two world wars and, and downtown, um, the repayment of the bonds. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned we're the only town that's ever repaid all of our, our bonds, but also going back to the Great Recession and then now the, the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And uh, so we, we very much um, in our corporation and our family to try to stay true to those, what we call the five tenets of, of community development. And um, I, can, I can stop here, give Pat a chance, or I can go on, whatever you prefer. Jack, you've given us a really good transition point to, um, to turn to Pat and, and talk about the work that a public interest project has, has done over the past 30 years downtown. Pat, over to you. Great, hey, thank you. I'm gonna, you're gonna get to see what an expert, uh, an expert Zoom presenter I am. In fact, you're gonna see that I'm not an expert Zoom presenter, so. That's uh, why I didn't even try to do it, Pat, because I know that that would <laughs> mess it up. <laughs> Okay. Pat, click your back button because you're coming up on the last slide in your deck. Yeah, I know, I know that. Um, and the trouble is, I got to get, I got to get out of the, got to get out of my stopped place on, on the slideshow. And I'll try a little bit more and then I'll give up. I don't know how to make it. Pat, I can share it. You just tell me when to um, click the slide. Okay, go ahead. Do my slideshow for me. My pleasure. Let me share my screen. So now you can see what happens when you try to have old people do a Zoom presentation. Uh, quickly, you already heard a lot of this from, uh, if you can make it the slideshow, Ed. Yep. 
That's great, thank you. You already heard some of this from Kevin. Kevin gave a great historical backdrop for this. Basically, Julian, um, I was an attorney here and I was doing some work for Julian. And in 1990, he came to me and said, Pat, I'd like to, I'd really like to invest the bulk of my assets in a company to try to help revitalize Asheville. Um, and so our concept was to invest in buildings and in businesses to try to help bring Asheville back. Other people were doing the same thing at the same time. One of the good things was there were a lot of great old buildings and because Asheville's economy had been difficult for so long, they just sat there. There was no reason to tear them down. And so they gave us a great opportunity to renovate a lot of historic buildings. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. The other, uh, can you switch that? Thank you. The other thing we were looking at was getting the lights turned on in the buildings upstairs with residents and getting people on the sidewalks after five o'clock and then creating interesting, appealing businesses on the first level. A number of these businesses we created and operated, a number of others we just supported um, because they were just part of the recipe, hopefully, to help bring downtown back. And again, there were a lot of other people working on this at the same time, which Kevin's gone over some of the names, and there were many other people locally who were involved in trying to bring downtown back. Why, why was it so hard? Next, next slide, Ed, thank you. Um, again, you've seen some of the pictures of what the city looked like, but the there was tremendous negativity as a result of this. There had been numerous efforts to try to bring downtown back. A number of developers came in and did what I call big bang projects. A number of them went bankrupt. Um, so we had some signs of life, but we still, we still struggled. At this point in Asheville's history in the 70s and 80s, most young people just moved out of town as soon as they got a chance. And it, it's interesting talking to people now, some people deny it was ever like that, you know, and I'm saying, well, it was like that when I was here, that's what I saw. And now we have all these great young people here. And part of that is a, uh, just a testament to the vitality we have now. So all the work we did and all the other people have been involved in revitalizing Asheville. Okay, next slide, Ed, thanks resulted in in this. We've got all these great accolades for our city. People are excited about Asheville. We're known all over the country. And a lot of this relates to, if you look at these things we got accolades for, a lot of it relates to the great local small businesses we've developed here. Um, and they're, they're a big part of our reputation and particularly a big part of the vitality of downtown. The next slide. Um, you know, Asheville, if you look at the country, small businesses and large businesses are about 50-50 with employment. Asheville, 96% of the businesses have 50 or fewer employees. And if you, if you use this 500 employee breakpoint for small businesses, 80% of our jobs are in small businesses. Um, but now, we're in the midst of something of a small business apocalypse. And um, to prove that resilience that we've had in the past, we're gonna, we're gonna have to help our small businesses get through it. Next slide, please. Um, you know, the challenge is we have some local money that's being put into small businesses. I mean, Jack worked with the TDA. There's a new $5 million fund to help our small businesses. One Bunkum is raising money. They've raised over a million dollars. Uh, but, but the need, is, as I calculated on the back of an envelope, is like 100 to $150 million based on the losses of all the hundreds of small businesses we've had being closed for two months effectively, and then now being open perhaps for the next three or four months with limited capacity and perhaps it's going to go longer than that because none of us can see in our crystal ball what's going to happen here. So, you know, nationally, small business and big business 50-50 in employment, but the money from the federal stimulus has gone three quarters to the big businesses and one quarter to small businesses, which is just an indication of the political power. I mean, the federal government knows we need support for small businesses, so they named one of their 
big business loan programs, the Main Street Loan Program, it's for businesses with up to 15,000 employees and five billion in annual sales. Um, I don't think there's any business in our downtown that has a hundredth of those kind of numbers. So there's not a lot of money relatively available to small businesses. We have some challenges with the two small business programs there are. The uh, Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program was the thing that they were first promoting a lot. They had $7 billion in it. They promoted it well enough so that small businesses applied for $383 billion and only $7 billion was available. So everybody's been very disappointed in that. I share that disappointment with our experience with that thing. We applied six weeks ago and haven't heard anything from them. The other major program is the Pay Paycheck Protection Program, PPP, which has been given a lot more money. Um, it started out giving people 10 years to pay, but it's been reduced now to two years to pay. It's a preserved paycheck plan though. It's not a small business plan because they've determined that they want 75% of the money being spent on payroll and only 25 on your other expenses. And the problem is they give you only eight weeks to spend it. And some of that eight weeks is being used up with all these businesses in downtown being closed. So it's pretty hard to spend payroll money when your doors are locked and nobody can come in. Um, there's been a lot of comment by economists at, the, at our great universities saying that uh, it's great that the federal programs are helping the less effective businesses, but typically those are the ones that are operating. It's not really helping the hardest hit ones, which are closed and have a difficult time using these programs. And that is what we have dominating our downtown. Um, you know, big businesses can raise money in other markets, which is a great thing. North Carolina is in the bottom six of the 50 states who can, who have given PPP loans. Um, I, I hope, you know, Asheville has been resilient. We, we've talked about all the challenges we've had in past years. And this is a major challenge, perhaps the biggest challenge we've had. We'll see. Um, it would be great if people could write to their congressmen and try to get them to liberalize these small business things because, you know, people need more than eight weeks to use this money. A lot of people are talking like, you know, if we can get six, six months to use the money as the program is kind of set up to allow, uh, then we could save our, our small businesses in downtown. National surveys of small businesses are, are showing that 30 to 50 percent of them expect to be closing in the next two to six months if we can't get more effective help. We have been a resilient, a resilient city, but I would hate to see, and I expect us to come back from this, but I would hate to see us lose the character of what we've all worked on and built over the last 30 years in the course of that. And I think I can stop there. So you have time for questions. Kevin, you're on mute. Amateur hour. Jack, when you and I first met, uh, you were a dairy farmer. Well, still and am. And then when we reconnected years later, you were in the process of building a multi-hundred million dollar um, community and the Great Recession hits. You've, you've had to do some pivots in your career. Uh, we're going to have to do some pivots in Asheville. Yep, yeah. Tell us a little bit about about pivoting and how how you do that with with things that you've done for years. Uh, sort of 30 seconds and I'll talk more about the future. When I returned home in 1985, I trained myself to work for my father in the dairy business. Nine months later, we sold it. And I looked at him, I said, well, that, that's a great confidence builder. Thank you very much. <laughs> and so we, we pivoted at that time and, and realized that real estate was the asset we had and went through the, the mechanisms I explained earlier. And then in 2008, 2009, the Great Recession, we started Biltmore Park uh, Town Square. And about 2010, our partner came to me and said, I can't have any more debt. So we took it all on ourselves. And I went to my father, who was 82 at the time. I said, what do you want to do? He said, just keep going. Because if you don't build it now, you never will. So we did. 
And so now we find ourselves in the middle of this, this pandemic. And I'm, you know me well enough, I'm always the eternal optimist. And so there's, there's certain attributes that Asheville has that I think will position us well uh, going forward. And, and one of those is we've talked in the past about just infrastructure, you showed pictures, but sort of utilitarian infrastructure. We have water and sewer and I-26 and I-40 and we have power and broadband, but the real, and we have the geography that's close to major part of the population of the United States. But to me, the real opportunity we have is in the talent, the workforce that's here, the trainable workforce, as you said, the, the work ethic that the people have in the region and, and we are resilient. So where I'm sort of thinking in my crystal ball as, as cloudy as it may be, is that we have quite a huge opportunity in the reshoring movement of, um, of companies. You read it in the paper about advanced manufacturing wants to adjust their supply chain uh, out of China and other places in the world. The BioLife Pharma companies, uh, we're lucky there's a large um, uh, number of those in the eastern part of North Carolina. Asheville has a very concentration of medical device companies. And I think the other side of it is software companies, and I've had conversations in the past with them, are looking to bring that employment base back into the United States. Now, what does that mean? We have a vibrant downtown. We have a beautiful natural surrounding. I think people are, are like they did after the 9-11. Uh, Asheville's always been a drive to market. It's been a safe haven. I think the same attributes of those mountains and, and, and the others that we just described will be very helpful in uh, recruiting companies or expanding those who want to be in the, a, a safe place. Uh, talk to many people around the state and the country. They're hearing that companies don't want to put all their talent in one location of one tall building and, and be hit by the COVID again. So they're talking about de uh, taking the density out and spreading it around into, into smaller cities uh, in the country. Maybe Charlotte, maybe Raleigh, but I'd take advantage of that for Asheville. And the reason I'm confident of that is we have a really good education system. Uh, we have great health care, and it's a low place uh, for to do business, uh, low cost. It's not, we're not peddling cheap land and cheap labor and free this, but we're, we're offering really good uh, talent in a great location that's centrally uh, located. So I, Jack, I'm, I'm optimistic about this. Pat, Jack gives us a good um, um, hopping point to a conversation that's coming up a lot in town and nationally right now about folks wanting to move out of the major cities and maybe move into places like Asheville. There's been some comments that Asheville's real estate market's not shifting a lot right now. Um, public interest projects has, one of your, one of the key uh, pedestals for you all has been housing and that you've worked in a variety of ways to provide different levels of housing. What are your thoughts about the housing in Asheville uh, moving forward? Well, I, I think that uh, it looks to me like, I mean, everything Jack said is correct. And my own analysis has been, you know, we're going to get a lot of people leaving some of the major cities to come to Asheville. It's a beautiful place. We have a lot of places you can live. People are going to want to spread out. Um, I, I think that that's, that's going to be one of the great strengths of Asheville going forward. It's gonna put more pressure on affordable housing because the more people who come with money from elsewhere to move into the community are, are gonna buy houses and we're, we're gonna have a continuing problem with affordability. Um, one of my major concerns really still going back is I'm concerned that if we can't save this vital downtown we have um, and, and help some of these businesses that are gonna be struggling, we're gonna have boarded up windows again, which I think may be hard for people to believe, but a lot of people don't understand how close to the margin a lot of small businesses are, and they don't have money to, to last. So, and I wanted to, besides writing your congressman, I hope people when they go to our, down, our small businesses downtown and elsewhere in the community, think about giving them an extra $10 on your bill or giving them an extra $100 on your bill if you can afford it, just to show them we're behind you and we want you to survive because we're gonna have great housing and we have a great long-term future, um, but I want us to keep our character. Yeah, I agree. Thanks, Pat. One of our questions asked, you know, from- Gavin, before you go there, 
I, I got to call time on us because it is 10 o'clock and, and we said we would stop at 10. I want to thank um, you and the whole panel for joining us this morning. You've done a fabulous job. Obviously, this conversation needs to go on and, and could go on for another 30 minutes easily. But um, I want to thank you for your time this morning and, and for giving us that backdrop, the history, um, the work that you guys, have, all three of you have done in our community is amazing. And, and I really appreciate that. And, and uh, I think just to echo comments, I think, Jack, that you made about, you know, it takes a collaborative effort um, and it, it's going to take us um, stepping up and recognizing the foundations and the building blocks and what we can build back on and that we have been in challenging times before and uh, we have been resilient and it's going to take that kind of grit again. Uh, Pat, Pat, to your point, we're, we're going to have to go back to restaurants and independent businesses downtown and support those folks if we want to keep them. So it is a challenging time. Given that, I also just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, again, I want to thank our co-presenting sponsors, Dixon Hughes Goodman and, and the Van Winkle Law Firm and our community and, and sustaining sponsors. Do want to let you know, folks, if, if you're interested, Leadership Asheville is moving forward with next year's Leadership Asheville Class 39. We've been around almost 40 years now, um, and we're excited to offer this program for folks ready to step into community and community leadership. So if you're interested, um, our, our website, their program information is all available. It's at leadershipasheville.unca.edu. Um, I, I, a couple things, over, uh, our next breakfast, if you will, our next buzz will be May 28th. We're gonna look at um, leadership mind, uh, uh, mindset change um, and dealing with change because we're all facing that right now. So we've got some folks coming in. So join us on May 28th for that. Um, a recording of this, this morning's presentation will be up on the website in, in about 24 hours. Um, so for those of you who are late to it, or if you know someone who wants to see it and wasn't here, please tell them to, to look at that. I do want to throw a, a plug out for um, some of the artists in the area and, and particularly LEAF. This weekend was supposed to be the LEAF Festival out at uh, Lake Eden. And I know many natives or folks who've been here for a while have been, that's been a tradition. Um, they are doing a virtual LEAF and that would be a great way to support them moving forward as well. So check that out. And, and then lastly, it is a challenging time and it's a challenging time for Leadership Asheville as well because the Buzz Breakfast is typically one of our major fundraisers and as a nonprofit, we could really use your support. So if you've enjoyed today's event and you wanna see more of those, please consider donating if you can do that. It makes these community programs available. Um, there's a link on our website. Again, it's unca. Uh, Leadership Asheville at unca.edu. Thank you very much, folks. I appreciate the time. Um, and I hope, thank all of you for joining us this morning and we'll see you on the 28th. Ed, as we close, I'm reminded of the um, quote you and I talked about the other day about Winston Churchill. Never let a crisis go to waste. He Absolutely, was, totally agree. He was, he was saying crises like this have a dear price. And you know, the sun has risen 1.7 trillion times and it will rise again tomorrow. And Asheville has gone through five horrible, horrible collapses, and we will rise again tomorrow. Uh, well said. Thank you, Kevin. I'm looking Thank forward you, folks. To it. Thank you, Ed. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Thanks. everybody. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, Pat. Thanks, Kevin. See you, Pat.